17. A few years ago, while in seminary, I had to read a book. I had to read a whole lot of books in seminary, but one of the books, although the title escapes me now, makes us think about that sometimes you do things and you only think about the positive side of what you do, but it is important to also think about the negative side of what you do. One of the positive sides of having screens is it helps people to read the scriptures who wouldn't have read the scriptures if you didn't put it on the screen. The negative side is you have folks who go, they're going to put it on the screen, so I don't need my word. I could just look at it on the screen. And because uh, you have folks now who don't bring Bibles, right? Because they don't have any intentions of following you in the scriptures. And I want to suggest to you that since you have all those Bibles at your house and you have that smartphone, be prepared to follow along with the preacher. Um, I don't have anything to say that is not in scripture. Um, I, I wasn't preparing to say this. So what we push here is exegetical teaching, expository preaching. Expository preaching is explaining what is in scripture. There are other places that read a passage and then they just preach whatever. Our responsibility is to preach what the scriptures say. Amen. Um, and so what I want from you all, what's imperative for you, is to be reading the text along with us. So that when we say something, you see where did he or she get that from. That makes sense? But it's hard to do that if you don't have a Bible in front of you. All right. Uh, Job is, a, is, is a, a famous story uh, that's in Scripture. And uh, I want you all to look with me. Um, you have to know that we can't preach 42 chapters that comprises the story of Job. And so even though we're going to look at this seven to eight verses, you got to know that the story of Job took 42 chapters to tell. All right, look, look at verse 10. And after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his house. And they comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought upon him. And each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen, a thousand donkeys, and he also had seven sons and three daughters. The first daughter he named Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third, y'all pronounce it for me because I don't know how to pronounce that, Karen Hapak. Uh, nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters and their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. Verse 16, and after this Job lived a hundred and forty years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And so he died old and full of years. Somebody say amen. amen. Father in heaven, we bless you for this morning. We're grateful, God, for this great privilege that we have of being the church of the living God. We are the gathering of people who are gathering around the idea that Jesus is the Christ that Jesus is the son of the living God and that he died for the redemption of mankind and we are included in those who have been redeemed, who have been bought with a price. 
And therefore, we choose to glorify God in our body and in our spirits because they belong to God. God, stand up in my body and preach through my mouth. Make it so, God, that we have ears that can hear, that we have eyes that can see, and that we have hearts that are not like concrete, but are hearts that are of flesh and can feel what you are saying to Southern Friendship and to all who are watching us online, what you are saying to us on this day. And we pray in that name that is above every name, the name of Jesus the Christ and all of us who love the Lord said, amen. What if God doesn't do immediately what you want him to do? Do you have discipline? Do you have patience? Do you have dedication? Do you have the spiritual fortitude to wait on God? Or are you like that elementary school puppy love, that middle school puppy love, that when the, the, the little girlfriend or little boyfriend doesn't do what they want, they say they quit them? Uh, I don't know what they call it now, but when I was in school, you go, I quit you. Some people, at the first sign of trouble, quit God. Now, they don't say they quit God. They just quit praying. They quit reading their Bible. They quit public worship. They quit fellowship with the saints of believers because, in reality, they are frustrated with God. And we're careful about voicing how frustrated we are with God. We're careful about how we, we uh, raise that, God, I got a beef with you. I got an issue with you. But the truth is, there are times with us when we ain't feeling God so much. There's some folks who spend as much time broken up as they spend together. They together, but they got an on again, off again relationship, and you don't know when you talk to them whether they are on again or if they're off again. You can tell she ain't feeling them because all of her social media posts are subliminal posts about how trifling he is. You can tell, uh, y'all ain't helping me here, some even have what they describe as irreconcilable differences. And I'm suggesting to you today that there are people, when God isn't moving as quickly as they want, isn't doing what they want, that they find themselves in irreconcilable differences with God. How do you get to a place where even with God, we can't reconcile? Today, I want to talk to y'all from this real simple sermon subject, Hold on to your faith. I have three main exegetical points. That is points that you're going to get where you can look back at the story of Job and say, I see where you got that from. The fourth one is a point of application. It's a homiletical point because there's no point in reading scripture. There's no point in understanding what scripture has to say if I'm not going to do anything with it. And do you know that's one of the major problems of Christianity, that we want to come and listen to sermons? We don't want to put feet to the sermons. I want to listen to sermons about hatred and bigotry, listen to sermons about forgiveness just when it's my turn to forgive. Like, well, I don't want to have to do that part. I hear the sermons about giving, I don't want to do that part. There's no reason for us to listen to sermons and preach sermons if the people who are listening to the sermons, y'all ain't going to help me here, ain't going to do it. There, there's a point in listening because at some point, we got to turn from listening to doing. Amen. Can I give y'all the first thing as you think about holding on to your faith? And that is the righteous do suffer. Uh, 
There are some people who have come to the erroneous conclusion that because you are right with God, that you should never have times of suffering. But that is a lie from the pit of hell that if you are the righteous of God, there will be times in your life when you suffer. We have this idea that the righteous are always blessed. Blessed and highly favored. And that is only the wicked who have to suffer. But I declare to you, if you read your Bible, you won't find such theology. I'm, I'm here to argue with you today that that type of theology is problematic. And it is that th uh, type of theology that gets the church in trouble when we have this prosperity preaching that if you come to Jesus, you ain't going to never have no trouble because when they have trouble, they are on their way out the door. No, you are coming to Jesus because he's going to get you into everlasting life. You ain't coming to Jesus with some pie in the sky that you ain't going to have no rainy days. There's a major problem now because we have situations like Job where we find the righteous suffering. And when you have a theology that says those who are the righteousness of God never suffer, you find yourself now saying, well, I don't know what to do now because y'all told me the righteous don't ever suffer. The righteous house never catches fire. The righteous car never is in an accident. The righteous children never act like fools. The righteous husband never acts like he lost his mind. So now what do you do? What do you do when you're righteous and you are suffering at the hand of God? You realize that they've been selling you a bill of goods and they've been lying to you. There is this idea now because the church should not believe in karma. But there's this large pocket of the body of Christ who believes now that if you are suffering publicly, it's because there is some private sin that you're being punished for. The story of Job makes it clear that that's a lie. And if you're one of those people that looks down your nose at someone because you don't know what's been going on behind the scenes, but they are suffering publicly, and you have come to the conclusion that the reason you're suffering publicly is because you did something trifling privately, you may be lying on them. Even Job's friends indict him. They say to Job for chapters, Job, there is no way that God will let happen to you what's happening to you, so you must have done something. Why don't you go on now and tell the truth, Job, and tell us what you did so that we can understand why God is letting this stuff happen to you. When you find out they got divorced, when you find out their child has had something happen. When you find out they've had a bad diagnosis, they've been diagnosed with cancer, they've been, you're, you're, if you're not careful, you will come to the conclusion that you got cancer because you did something. You, you didn't get the loan because you did something. And Job argues that that is not necessarily true. Psalm 34. Can I tell y'all what Psalm 34 verse 19 says? It says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. That righteous people have afflictions. The promise is that even when you are afflicted, I'm going to deliver you out of them all. But your Bible doesn't tell you you won't have afflictions. It doesn't tell you that trouble won't come and knock on your door. It doesn't tell you that, that, that drama won't come to your house. Sometimes drama comes to your house. Job's friends meant well, but they were wrong. And sometimes we're sincere in what we're doing, 
But you should make a note of this. Sometimes you can be sincerely wrong. Now, uh, though Job is not responsible for his suffering, we, um, we must not make the mistake of making other people responsible for their suffering. Now, that's not to say that sometimes I didn't smoke cigarettes for 60 years and the, the complications of what I did to my lungs, sometimes I did that to myself. Amen. Sometimes I ate way too many calories in a day for years and my body reflects that I didn't stick to the 1,500 calories or the 2,000 calories. Y'all not saying amen. But sometimes I'm where I am because I ate like I did. Um, as, as a 15-year-old, my mouth was full of cavities. I, re, I remember we, we were poor, so I never sat in a dentist chair until I was 15 years old, and the dentist said, your mouth don't hurt? And I said, no, no, sir, my mouth don't hurt. And he said, well, you got here just in time because what them now ladies have done to your teeth. I must have gone to Pastor Adgerson, I must have gone to him for about eight months with him fixing cavities. And the truth was, I didn't just have cavities. I had cavities because I had an affair with now laters. Um, here it is. It's okay to recognize that sometimes people are suffering and not blame the person for the suffering. Secondly, not to blame God for the suffering. Because we got to blame somebody, right? No, you don't have to. You can just recognize that a person is suffering. That leads me to the second thing that I want to tell y'all, and that is that when the righteous suffer, God is still just. Some folks love on you while everything is going right, and then as soon as things ain't going right, they use that as an excuse to tell you how they really felt about you. And it's not like they just started feeling you like that. It's, they, they've been feeling about you like that all along. They just needed some excuse to really show you their whole card. I've been carrying that card in my hand all along. I just finally got an excuse to pull that card out. Now, if you come to the conclusion that, that the righteous do not suffer, then you could come to the, cl the claim or you could come to the conclusion that when the righteous are suffering, it's God's fault. I don't know about you, but I've been in this situation where I'm mad at God. I'm mad. I'm not talking about I'm beefing with God. No, I got an attitude with God. Pray for what? Read my Bible for what? I don't want to read no scriptures about, you talking about the God that let my truck get broken? You talking about the God that let me get fired? You talking about the God that, you, I don't want to, I know y'all, I'm going to testify for you that there have been some times, although you don't want to admit it, you've been mad at God because you're holding God responsible. Um, here it is, Job, according to Job chapter 1 at verse 8. Job, there is, God says about Job, there is no one on earth like him. He's righteous. The enemy comes in to challenge God. God brags on Job. Say, have you considered Job? Have, have you considered my servant? I'm declaring, God is declaring to the devil, there is nobody like Job. It's the level of righteousness that he has. And so if you're saying if a righteous man can then experience trouble, why? And how? How is it when you dot all your I's and you cross all your T's? 
You got periods at the end of all your sentences. You've run grammarly through your document so that it doesn't have. How when you've done all that do you find yourself suffering? Here it is that God does not punish Job. God simply allows Job to experience tragedy. And that's a big difference. There's a difference in letting you go through something and being responsible for you going through it. Because now we turn around and go, well, God, you made me have an accident. No, I let you have an accident. Even while Job was under attack, he was still covered by God. So you got to go back to chapter one and chapter two to understand that the enemy wants, he wants the ability to attack Job and God grants him the ability to attack Job, but he puts some, a limit, he puts a limit on how much he can attack. He's saying you can go after his body. You can go after his possessions. You can go after his family. You cannot touch his soul. The question for us is, how much of an attack can we take? Because God brags on Job that I'm banking on. Here's what God is saying to Satan. I'm banking on down to his soul. Job is not going to let go of his faith. When when you attack his possessions, he ain't going to let go of his faith over that. When you attack his children, he's not going to let go of his faith over that. When you attack his money, he ain't going to let go of his faith over that. I'm, here's God saying, down to his, his possess, down to his soul, if you strike everything else, Job is going to hold on to his faith. Now, the question for us is, how much will I endure before I let go of my faith? Uh, I grew up in in, in, uh, in in the inner city in the 70s and 80s. And you remember uh, playing caller in the streets and we would go, I was going to be your friend, but nah. Uh, God, I was going to serve you, but nah. I, I was going to be with you, but but you, God, you let this happen. And I was with you losing my job. I was with you losing Keisha. I I was with you up until this, but now, God, you've let too much happen. I can't be faithful to you now because you you get, there there are times when we're saying to God, I'm with you as long as, and I can't be with you because you let too much happen. Can I give y'all what bad theology does? And some of us are guilty of bad theology. Bad theology blesses God for good, but curse God for bad. Job's wife says, now, with all that you've gone through, why don't you just go on and curse God? And Job's saying, no, you got bad theology. I I thought my wife had better theology than that, but you got bad theology. If I can take blessings from God and consider him righteous, I can take bad and still consider him righteous. Now, how you respond to trouble says a whole lot about who you are. Job in chapter 1 at verse 21 has a perfect response. And Job says, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. Here's what Job says. When I came from my mother's womb, I had nothing. Yeah, I ain't have anything. And and when I die, I'm not going to have anything. So here's what he says. The Lord gave. And the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Here's what Job is saying. I've been, I was broke when I was born. And now that I got a little something, or in his case, I had a little something, I'm never going to forget that what I had, I had because God gave it to me. 
So if God in his wisdom gives it to me and God in his wisdom takes it from me, I'm still going to bless the name of God. Is that your testimony today that when I'm up, I'm going to give God praise. And even when I'm down, I'm going to give God praise. David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise will continually be in my mouth. His praise is going to be in my mouth when I got money in my pocket. And his praise is going to be in my market when I ain't got nothing in my pocket. Yes, sir. Because he's still good. In fact, I don't have words to describe how he is. He is good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Here's what Job says in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Job 14, 14, he says, if a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed life, all the days of my appointed time, will I wait until my change come? Uh, Here's what he's saying. After you've been riding with Jesus, you ain't got nobody else you want to ride with. If my help don't come from God, I'm not turning to nobody else. All the days that I got, I'm going to sit right here. Uh, I'm not turning to no pipe. I'm not turning to no cavassier. I'm not turning to no weed. I'm not turning to Tyrone. I'm not turning to nobody else. I'm going to wait right here on God. Um, In all of Job's suffering, Job continued to trust God and his actions demonstrated that he was trusting in God. You know, some of us have this affliction, Donnell, where we talk out both sides of our mouth. We say one thing, but our actions demonstrate something else. We say we love God with all of our hearts, except when trouble comes, we ain't faithful to God no more. Job shows us now how to go through tragedy and still continue to trust God. It's it's, it's this idea that God, even when I'm at my best, it doesn't match up to you when you're at your worst. Now, if you know that God is righteous, it causes you to do better while you're waiting. Waiting is hard now. Listen, waiting is hard if you're questioning God while you're waiting. Because now I got beef with you. Because, like, I know you're coming, but when? And, and it's been a year, and, and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. And it's been five years, and... But I'm still waiting, and and when you're going to come. And here it is that you're saying, I don't know when you're going to come, but here's what I have come to the conclusion, is that if I'm going to get it, it's going to be because you come. Uh, You ever seen a child that's waiting, and they're saying they don't have an attitude, but they're waiting with their eyes rolled up to the ceiling, and they're waiting with their arms... And uh, they're waiting with their hand behind their back, just leaning against the wall and all that. And some of us would be bothered with a child that was waiting on you that way. But the question is, are you waiting on God that way? I'm waiting, but I'm waiting with an attitude. No, God, you're righteous. And that I'm going to claim, God, that while I'm waiting... You're still just. You're still faithful. You're still my God. Regardless of what I'm going through. Can I take you to the third thing that I want you to know? And that is the righteous will be vindicated. You got to know that thing. You, you got to be in a place. See, you can't be losing and think that I'm a loser. Uh, I'm losing, but I'm not a loser. Yeah, uh, I might be down, but I'm not going to stay down. 
Uh, I might be behind in the score, but that does not mean that I identify ever with losing. Yeah, you, uh, you, you don't know who I am and you don't know who my daddy is that he specializes in doing things that seem to be impossible. Now, sometimes the followers of Jesus are vindicated in this life. And then there are times that they are vindicated not in this life, but in the next life. And we can't come to a conclusion that if our vindication does not come until the next life, that we weren't vindicated. Uh, sometimes you are not going to get your deliverance on this side of the Chile Jordan. Though the vindication is delayed, it is de not denied, even if it is delayed until the next life. We want to believe that everyone is always vindicated in this life. I'm talking good here. Uh, but sometimes you are not vindicated. You are not delivered on this side. Sometimes the cancer that we have is unto death. Sometimes the depression is unto death. Sometimes the issues that we go through are we're not going to be set free from it on this side. But that's not that's not to say that I'm never going to be delivered. Amen. Because cancer may take my life on this side, but cancer has no power on the other side. Um. I don't know who, who, who made this quote, but, but here's an anonymous quote. It says, in the ruins of adversity, God crafts stories of redemption, revealing that our darkest moments pave the path to the brightest blessings. Sometimes you go through dark seasons to set you up for your bright seasons. Sometimes God takes you through rough patches to set you up for your smooth patches. Sometimes you go through down seasons because God is setting you up for your up seasons. And I can't allow my down season. I can't allow my dark season. I can't allow my broken season to overrun what God is doing in my life. Um. Job eventually was vindicated from his suffering. Job was vindicated while he was living. And here is the challenge, daughter of God. Here is the challenge, son of God. It's to hang in there knowing that God vindicates his people. Now, when you know that God vindicates, it takes you from fighting. Can I walk slow here? Because when you are in trouble, but you know you didn't do anything to get in trouble, it ain't your job to get you out of trouble. I ain't got to cuss you out. I ain't got to talk about you like a dog. I ain't got to slap your face. I ain't got to do nothing to you because where I am, God knows where I am. And when I'm going to get out, God is going to come get me out. God Almighty. Job in 42, Job in chapter 42, verse 12. Y'all skipped over this. It says, the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. Uh, Job went through a whole lot of stuff. But the end of his life, after he'd gone through all this stuff, is more blessed than the beginning of his life. And I want, to, I want to tell you here, because here's what, the, here's what the text is arguing for us, is to recognize that though you may have lost all, God can give it back to you. And it's hard now when I've got nothing to, and I know what it feels like to have all, to believe that I'm ever going to get to a place where I have all again. But I want to shout you up here. I want to excite you about the message of Job because Job doesn't just get back what he lost. 
Now, you're going to have to make a note here because according to Job chapter 1 at verse 3, Job had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys. But according to Job 42, 12, Job doesn't have 7,000 sheep. He's got 14,000 sheep. He doesn't have 3,000 camels. By the time he gets to the end, he's got 6,000 camels. When he began, he had 500 yoke of oxen. When he gets to the end, he's got 1,000 yoke of oxen. When he started out, he had 500 donkeys. When he gets to the end, he has 1,000 donkeys. That everything Job had, God doubled it. And we'd be excited to get our thousand dollars back, but no, God's gonna give you double for all the trouble that you've gone through if you can hang in there. Here's what your Bible says weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. Here it is. Can you hang in there while it's night? Don't you give up on God. You, you can't give up on God because God does not give up on you. That then when you feel like throwing in the towel, when you feel like quitting, here it is. God is saying, I'm going to give it back to you. Job doesn't run out on God. Job doesn't, he doesn't leave. He doesn't quit. He doesn't find himself saying, God, I quit you. You allow too much to come my way. Here's what Isaiah has said. Isaiah says, has thou not known? Has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Uh, but here we get to verse 31. But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hold on to your faith. I don't care how hard it gets, you hold on to it. Tie a knot around your hand if you have to, but hold on to your faith. Nelson Mandela is wrongfully imprisoned for 27 years. Nelson Mandela is in for 27 years. He is suffering uh, through 27 years of being in prison in South Africa. And under the oppressive system of apartheid, he is, he is oppressed and not just in prison, but in prison of hard labor. Well, with, with tremendous pressure from around the world, anti-apartheid pressure, uh, President F.W. de Klerk released Nelson Mandela from prison. And then F.W. de Klerk with Nelson Mandela, who had been in prison improperly for 27 years, they together negotiate how they're going to end apartheid. All right, y'all y'all ain't catching. He was in jail for 27 years. And when he finally gets out of prison for 27 years, the person who was imprisoned sits down and deconstructs the system that put him in prison in the first place. And for the first time, black people who were four times as much as white people in South Africa get a chance to vote and he goes from prison to the president's suite. 
I'm trying to tell you here that if Nelson Mandela had given up on God in them 27 years of sitting in that prison, he would never have made it to the palace of sitting in the president's suite. So he goes from uh, the clerk letting him out of prison to negotiating with him in order to end it to saying, I'm going to take your job. That's the God we serve, who can take you through all of this stuff. Mandela said, in my prison, you can become president. In my country, you can become president. You just have to go to prison first. <laughs> How about you? Are you in the middle of suffering? And you're tempted now to say, God, this is too much. Maybe if where God has you is just short of where your breakthrough is coming from. Have you become so convinced that you're righteous that you should not have any suffering? Because we start calling the laundry list to God as if he don't know what we're doing. God, I'm at church almost every Sunday. I, I attend Bible study. I get up in the morning and I do devotion. I am religiously educating my children. I am walking circumspectly in the world. I get down on the floor when I pray. I'm not like those heathens who pray standing up. I get down on the floor every night before I go to bed. And we start, I bring my tithe. And not, not what I call a tithe, but I bring the whole tithe. And I don't know why you let me go through all this. Can I, can I give y'all some application? Um, you cannot get in trouble and determine once you're in trouble who you're going to be. You got to know who you're going to be on your way into trouble. Now, how do you do that? You regularly affirm God's love for you so when tragedy happens, you will not question God's ability to restore you. You got to get up in the morning and say, I am the righteousness of God. I am the redeemed of God. I've been bought with a price. The precious blood of Jesus has bought my redemption. And regardless of what happens to me, I know that God loves me. Because if you don't know who you are, you will be in trouble and the enemy will start trying to tell you who you are. God don't love you. And you know, you are a liar. You are a yellow teeth liar. God loves me. God loves me. And nothing going on in my life will ever cause me to challenge whether or not God loves me. Yes, I'm going through some drama. Yes, I'm having some tragedy. But I know in my heart that God loves me. You ever seen the child where you try to do something to them and they like, that stuff don't bother me. Why? Because my mother and my father tell me over and over who I am. And because I have confidence of who I am, there's nothing anybody else could say to me to make me question who I am. Because when I leave here, I know I can go home to my mother and my father and they're going to look after me and they're going to love me. So if you don't love me, it don't matter. I will go to my parents. You don't like me? Too bad. And you got to be in a place where you're saying, I know for myself that my God loves me. All I need is to get back to my secret place. I need to get back to my bedroom. I need to get back to the closet. In my, there, there's a room where I go meet God, and if you mess around and let me get back to the place where I meet God, I promise you I'm gonna be all right. Can I give y'all some homework? You need to write out some affirmations. You need to write out some stuff that you remind yourself on a regular basis that I'm him. I'm God's favorite. Uh, God has his hand on me. 
the, the, uh, I'm, not, I'm not telling you that he ain't got his hand on you, but I'm telling you what I know for myself. His hand is on me. Uh, Y'all know the young folks are saying something, but uh, God don't play about me. Uh, he might play about you, but I'm telling you now that when it comes to me, I'm telling you about Frankie Great and God don't play about me. So when drama comes my way, it do, God, you still love me. I know you love me. You don't give me everything I want, but I know you love me. Uh, let me give you this example. Uh, years ago, my son was playing little league football, and I was working in St. Louis. And uh, so I said, hey, um, man, uh, y'all making it to the playoffs, and uh, I'm going to be working in St. Louis next week. Um, you're going to be okay because I can't make your game. And uh, his little 11, 12-year-old answer, he said, Dad, you made all my games. Uh, so if you can't make it next week, you know, I, I know you love me. What would happen if God's people were saying, I know you love me. There's some stuff that's landed at my door that I really don't want to deal with. But I know you love me. I know you still got my back. Refuse to use tragedy as an opportunity to question God. There's some of us who would say, oh, God, I've questioned you. And how could you really love me and let me go through this? Amen. Regularly affirm God's love for you. Amen. Does, God's, does Job's story bless you at all? Does it give you some encouragement? Yeah. There are times when folks are just trifling towards you. Life is trifling towards you. Life can be so disrespectful. You got all your nice, neat little plans about how stuff is going to go, and life comes and just kick it all over. Would y'all stand?